Morning. If everyone can kind of sit towards the middle, because we'll have a hundred other of our closest friends joining us, that would be great. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we've got a full day, so I'm just gonna jump in and I'm sure we'll have lots of people shuffling in as we go. I hope everyone had a delicious evening. Um, all of the meals and recipes that you had last night at the reception will be shared with you electronically after the conference, so be excited about that. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to download the app. If you haven't, you can do it now. So you either got an email with a link that you can click on and enter RTF17, or you can go to the App Store and search CIA Leadership, and then enter RTF17. Um, we are going to do a little group exercise. So we're going to have several Q&A sessions today and tomorrow that you get to ask questions from your phones. So if you go to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com. I'll just wait, I hear a lot of typing, so I'm just gonna wait it out. And then you'll enter event code RTF17. All right. And we can probably pop open Slido chat. Cool. So We'll get questions, and you can ask anything you want right now, and they'll get popped on this main screen that you can see, and the cool thing is the moderator will see your burning desires and questions right here, and that's how she or he will know what you wanna hear, and that's, that's what will drive our Q&A. So make sure to have that open and ready whenever we do Q&As. Um, we'll actually have one after this first session, so Michael Backer is ready, ready to be at demand for your questions. Um, cool, so that's that. And then our next order of business is finally figuring out the wines from Flavor Disco last night. Um, so as you all remember, you wore headphones, you listened to some funky tunes, you tried wine. Um, I'm just trying to advance slides. Cool. So, we had wine A and wine B, and just a quick show of hands. Who remembers? Did you, who liked wine A the most? Raise your hands. Maybe like a third. Okay, wine B. Seems like wine B was maybe the majority in the audience. The wine B was my favorite too. So top three descriptors for wine A were earthy, spicy, tobacco, which I, I think I had similar notes when I tasted. 
Wine B was bright, juicy, jammy. I had a very similar experience. And the most preferred wine was wine A. Um, so, you, so we have a lot of tobacco, earthy lovers in the audience. Um, and so just some notes behind the wines that you tried. It was the same wine. Oh my gosh, mind blown. Um, so just showing you the difference that, you know, what music can really do in terms of flavor experience and how it impacts taste. And a huge thank you to Rare Cat, who was at our flavor reception last night and supplied the wine for us. So thank you so much. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this podium over to your MC, um, Ali. Hello. Morning. Who in her here enjoyed uh, the Napa Valley last night? Who in here showed everyone that you know on Instagram how perfect your life was in that moment? <laughs> and therefore, how perfect the Napa Valley still is? Truly. Did anybody do that? Do you have pictures that you can later, Graham? Do that. Thank you. Um, it is a... 39, and uh, this is still all about food. Please remember that. Um, we're going to talk about a couple things, but can we do a round of applause for the people who are putting on three things th this year? Because that was that was the best block of talks that I've ever seen at a CIA conference. That was I felt awake. Um, we're going to talk about weed and butter. Which one do you guys want to do first? <laughs> weed. OK. Um, who in here has ever consumed an edible marijuana product? An edible marijuana product. Who in here has ever enjoyed that experience beyond the psychoactive part? Who, who's got the most culinary prowess when it comes to making stupid gummy bears filled with THC? This is going somewhere. Um, that, that's, gonna, that's happening. That's, that's going to happen. Um, drifting across our desk uh, more and more every month are stories and, and proposals and talks with potential clients who are looking to do culinary things with marijuana. Um, regardless of how puritanical you feel about it, um, it is a thing that should taste good. Um, this is gonna, I, I have something to say about waste streams when we're talking about butter, but one of the really cool revolutions that happened in the fine dining world a few years ago was that um, the arbitrary distinctions of uh, high, high class luxury ingredients versus low class common ingredients were completely dismantled, and a carrot was raised to as high of standing as caviar or foie gras, because you should be able to coax deliciousness out of food as long as you know what buttons to push and how to manipulate it. The same thing applies to marijuana. And there is going to be the biggest insane niche for people who are able to dig into the ingredient functionality of how that thing works and how to make it good and how not to just put it into things without you knowing. There are going to be emulsions. There are going to be breads. There are going to be things that need to be shinier. There are things that are going to need to be crispy, all with that. And whether or not that's something that's on your radar, uh, it will make an insane amount of money. So that was that. Um, I was talking to Daniel Gould from Alpha Food Labs last night, which is an activity I would recommend you all indulge yourselves in. Um, we were talking about ghee. Who in here has consumed ghee? The exact same number of people. Um, <laughs> how do you make ghee? Clarified butter, and what's left over? What do, you, what do you get after that process? Milk solids. So for a lot of people, the whole dietary point of ghee is to get rid of all the uh, little sugars and proteins and leftover solid bits, right? For those of us who do not have that dietary hang up, um, it is a crazy shame to see ghee being made and then the milk solids just getting cleaned out and thrown. Because do you know how many hours of culinary school are dedicated to try to find that kind of flavor? It's insane. And uh, when we're talking about scale and responsibility, one thing that my partners and I love working on is creative uses for waste streams. And um, 
we, we had a Maslow's hierarchy of need yesterday, so I want to talk about Bloom's taxonomy of learning. You guys remember that from, from middle school when you were told why flashcards don't work? It's, it's the premise that if you're, there's, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of um, effectiveness of learning, and at the very bottom of the pyramid is uh, remembering and memorization, and then you understand and you apply, and at some point you create and synthesize new things. There should be a taxonomy of how we deal with waste streams, and at the very bottom should be thrown it away, put it in a landfill. Just barely better than that is f compost. We, there's, we have enough stuff to compost. <laughs> Slightly better than that is to feed it to animals. Way better than that is to feed it to humans. And we're starting to get in there. There is that, that tippy top of the pyramid is to feed it to humans with style. To look at waste streams, and th I think when, when that stuff really is going to stick and, and, and hang around and make an impact on the industry, is when we start looking at waste streams that are better equipped for specific tasks than the fresh version of that thing. Like, yeah, it's great to take ugly fruit and put it into a smoothie. You can put literally anything into a smoothie and it will work. What are, when are we going to find the applications where overripe peaches and all of the pectin and all of the sugar that they have make it perfect for making peach dulce de leche or something like that. Um, when we're talking about ghee, I was just thinking about a, a tank of, of toasted, perfectly roasted butter solids that are left over. Um, we're going to hear from Costa, right, later today? Somebody? Yes? Yeah? Chef Costa from the Three Michelin Star Restaurant at Meadowood um, is going to be here talking later today. They do a drink at their bar that's the best version of bourbon I've ever had, and it's a brown butter walnut bourbon. You could make that at scale, 1,000 percent. Booze is so easy to work with at scale. And you could do that basically for free with pre-toasted ghee solids. And to take that one step further, you could turn that into a canned cocktail that was ready to go in the winter, and that could happen instantly. And that kind of thinking about waste streams is the thing that keeps me up at night in a good way. And uh, yeah, just wanted to put that out there for everybody to be ruminating on. So my MC job was to talk about weed and bourbon. Uh, the first person we're going to bring up today is Michael Bacher. Um, since I introduced him yesterday, I think Google served 175,000 meals, truly. <laughs> um, in, in the 80s, cooks used to brag about how many covers they did at their restaurant, so ultimate bragging rights. Michael. Good morning, everybody. Very happy that all, you, that all of you came back this morning, and hopefully just like we, you followed instruction well last night, and you went out there and truly enjoyed Napa, Sonoma, and all the great towns that you have over here. To kick, it off, to kick us off this morning, I want to build briefly upon what I shared with you yesterday afternoon. One of the human truths we have discovered is this act of togetherness, where it's really about thinking through how modern families are dealing with the rapidly evolving world. And one of the human truths we discovered is about it's creating the experience. It is not just about setting the table, or it's not just about the food. We have two fabulous speakers this morning who are going to help us actually to think through how can you create these very engaging experiences for consumers. So it's no longer just about great design or great food product design, but about the overall experience. The first speaker I'm going to bring up is Scott Freeman. He's from Toronto. He is the Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Vice President of ID Couture. He's a creative business artist who connects big ideas with brands, products, and experiences. A design thinker who operates at this magical intersection of business model uh, innovation as well as experience design. He has worked around the globe for magical brands such as PepsiCo, Whirlpool, Nestle, Target, AT&T, Four Seasons, and others. He has a fabulous story to tell to us about experience design. Scott. Thank you. I was trying to think about what I would talk about today. So many people talk about new products, trends, the future. I, th 
thought I would use a family lens. And uh, I realized that when we think about the experience of food, we can't just think about the future, but we should also kind of mind the past. And uh, I thought that my family would be the perfect kind of lens to tell this story. Let's see if we can get some PowerPoint slides. So I'm going to talk about 100 years of food, starting in uh, 1939, and uh, walk you into the future. Because um, sometimes I think hindsight is as important as foresight in the food space. So this story starts in Budapest in 1939. Um, my family kind of living there, running what I like to describe as the Dean and DeLuca of Budapest in 1939, running a little kind of gourmet store it's before you know, the Safeways and Whole Foods of the world even existed. Right? It's, it's, it's an era where we had curators and where people had to think about a relationship with a consumer or a customer. Um, so that's where the story starts. And uh, there's a little picture of the family. Um, but I was thinking about all the, the connections that uh, people have. Food, love, connection. You know, what is food? Um, and what's our kind of visceral internal experience? Um, you know, it's easy to talk about the package. The great, uh, yesterday, super example, you know, the, the coconut oil um, peanut butter cup. Um, but what's, what, what are we feeling? What, what is nourishment? You know, what's that kind of biochemical reaction in the body? And I think a lot of that comes from sharing food and, and connecting with family. So we kind of start there. Um, I guess... I was thinking about food and an experience I had a few years ago. I was sitting in the basement at Campbell's. I don't know if anyone's been to Camden, New Jersey. Um, very, very old industrial um, town across the river from Philadelphia. I was sitting in the basement in their archives with uh, their kind of chief historian. And, you know, they're telling us about Campbell's, and, and he says at one point, do you know that Campbell's at one point was the Apple computer of America. You know, we, we often talk about, you know, the technology that's kind of seeping its way, the valley and all this kind of IoT and, and food stuff that's finally happening at the intersection of startups and, and, and the world that we're talking about. But I love this example because Campbell's was a high-tech company. We talk about all the problems at the center of the store today, but to think that, that Campbell's Soup was a high-tech company, right? Condensing and canning, that, that was high-tech in, 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 in those years. Um, so I thought that was just a really interesting moment to sometimes think about you know, what something is or was versus what it is today or could be in the future. Fast forward a little. You know, all this industrial capacity, and suddenly we take this kind of industrial mindset that fed a war, and suddenly it's feeding this food revolution, big food. You know, it's interesting, today we talk about how big food's dying, or certainly suffering, but this was the beginning. This was the era of where big food grows, and we start to kind of move to mass production and, and things like that. Um, I love this example, because we talk about home meal replacement and convenience and eating on the go, and millennials need convenience, and I mean, look at this. This is, I don't know who, who in the room, you know, ate a TV dinner in their childhood. Um, hopefully some hens. I don't, not the type of thing that a millennial maybe ate in that form. Um, certainly, it's a kind of dying category. But this was an amazing experience. I, and, and I don't know, you know if you have memories, but certainly my memories of eating a TV dinner and watching TV are amazing. You know, the dessert part of the tray is, <laughs> it's amazing. And that's something. That's something special. It's, you know, it's, it's amazing to look at all the new products and, and kind of ask yourself, when was the last time that you had that emotional reaction to a product? So 1954, the invention of the TV dinner. And that's where my family kind of comes in. My grandfather emigrated to Canada and uh, wanted to start a business. And uh, over a weekend, he uh, was taken to a chicken farm and he thought the little chicks were so cute that he decided he would go into the chicken business. <laughs> it's a strange kind of thought when you think about, you know, have you been in a chicken house lately? It's, 
not a pleasant experience, but of course, they're very cute. And uh, I grew up watching Julia Child, but I'm told that his original vision was if you start with the cute little chick and you kind of end up there. Um, the vision was originally, can I kind of grow chickens? Can I grow the grain that they eat? Can I kill them? Can I process them? Can I sell them in stores? It was kind of like the Starbucks of chicken. That was the vision. Um, sadly, he went bankrupt doing that very briefly in 1972. So the vision didn't exactly work. But uh, that was the, 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 the world I was born in. I was born in 1972. Um, so I was born into this chicken family. I kind of grew up on, on a factory floor with chicken feathers and, and so forth all around me. Now, 1972 is a really interesting year in the food world. And being a Canadian, I, I can either very, be very proud or very guilty about uh, the invention that I'm going to talk about. And that is the, the, has anyone heard of the fish coffin? The fish coffin is the packaging that Canadians came up with to ship bluefin tuna from the waters of Nova Scotia to Japan. So I'm a baby, and this, I, I, I kind of think of this moment as the beginning of the end when it comes to sort of what's happening in sustainability and seafood. Um, this was the moment where sushi kind of globalized and industrialized, and they took empty Japan Airlines um, airplanes and loaded them up with fish coffins, bluefin tuna. So that was, that's not me. Um, I had bright red hair. I'm going to fast forward a little later because I joke that my childhood was living the food experience. I was a kind of guinea pig. You know, my father would bring products home from the factory, so to speak, and give them to me and say, do you like them? So I had chicken nuggets with peanut butter in them and chicken rings and you name it. Sweet chicken, chicken with pop rocks, anybody? <laughs> I've had it all. But in, uh, in the 90s, I had just come back from uh, university. I was working at Bain & Company as a management consultant. And he said, I have the greatest thing. It's amazing. So what is it? It's a dinosaur-shaped chicken nugget. You can laugh. I kind of laughed. I went, hmm, interesting. And uh, gave it to some kids and watched their reaction. You know, you talk about that emotional reaction food experience, right? And suddenly kids are playing, they're in this, they go into this fantasy land, they're playing with dinosaurs on a plate, they're making drawings, you know. And uh, so Dino Buddies, I'd like to say that that's my father's claim to fame, but Dino Buddies kind of launched and took over America, I'm sure. If you've met a millennial or if you are a millennial, you've eaten these at one point. But it's also an interesting point in time because that was the year Ferran Adria got three stars from Michelin. And that really was, I think, the moment where molecular gastronomy kind of hit the world. So, interesting moment. Now, my story is a story that mirrors what happened in big food. Big food got so big, it got fat. Fat with profits, fat with habits. We often, in innovation, talk about orthodoxies, getting stuck on things. Well, that's my father. I don't uh, know who the person next to him is in this picture. I had to dig up some old pictures. But at this moment in time, my father, his three brothers that he was in business with, and my grandfather, they couldn't go in an elevator together. And the reason, shockingly, if you look at me, was that they were almost 2,200 pounds collectively, all of them you know, 400 pounds plus. And so what did big food do to them? They were living big food, they were working in big food, and they got big. And my father decided this couldn't go on and decided to sell the company. And uh, the paperwork arrived at the hospital. Um, he uh, had a massive infection, was in intensive care, almost died as the deal was closing. And so they bring the paperwork to the hospital. He signs. He goes into a coma for three days. Deal's closed. And wonders, everyone's wondering, will he live? Will he not live? Thankfully, he lived. And uh, he was relatively young at the time. And he said, what am I going to do? How do I kind of make this right? You know, I live big food. Now I'm going to do small food and slow food and better food. 
and he became a vegan. Imagine being in, being in the meat business for 40 years. He became a vegan, and uh, he started experimenting with pulses. He, he kind of asked the question, can we make pasta from lentils and, and peas and things? And so he um, started this brand that I'm sure some of you have seen at Whole Foods and elsewhere uh, called Tolerant. Um, so that was his retirement project. It was meant to be a little thing, kind of experiment, and next thing you know, he's starting another food company as he's recovering. And then, in my life, 2007 was when we started Idea Couture, and where we said, doesn't the world need something called an innovation agency? We think. We're not sure. Let's try it. Nobody had innovation money. There were no people with titles that had innovation. We kind of had to scrounge around for, for people to, to do things with us. But thankfully, as time went on, innovation became a thing, and we're talking a lot about it today. And uh, thank thankfully, we've gotten to do a lot of good food innovation work uh, over the last decade. Fast forward to today. Um, I'm thinking about what is the future of food experience. And I was thinking about millennials. They love traveling. Everyone talks about we're, we're winning an experience economy. What is that? You know, what is a food product that has experience tied to it? There's the experience of consuming it, the emotional reaction. But what if the story is much bigger? And uh, there's a friend of mine in the audience, Marina, over there from Brazil. And she's been going through a really interesting process over the last year. She's been traveling into the Amazon and studying the biodiversity that exists and looking at plants and looking at old recipes and looking at roots and flowers and asking, what could this mean? How can I take this to the world? So there's an interesting kind of story here. What is a food startup? Is a food startup in a lab in the valley? Or is it in this amazing lab, you know, the laboratory that we call the Amazon? And um, so she's doing what I think is an amazing kind of startup idea, trying to bottle that, trying to take that biodiversity, trying to take the richness of the Amazon, the sustainability of the Amazon, and the stories of the Amazon. Because I don't think a product like this should just be the bottle, you know? And she's often talked about taking people into the Amazon. Let's go, you know, we, in the coffee business, sometimes people talk about traveling to coffee farms and so forth, cupping coffee. But what would it be like if people could go into the Amazon and really see and learn and touch and feel the people that are harvesting things and so forth? And, you know, we talk about big corn and big wheat and big sugar. We often don't talk about all this amazing kind of biodiversity and all these these super fruits and things. We, we've seen a super fruit kind of revolution in the last 10 years, but it's just the beginning. We've tasted less than 1% of the Amazon. You know, everyone loves coconut water and acai and, and a few other things, but there's thousands of ingredients. There's thousands of recipes. There's, it's used for healing. It's, it's amazing. So where do we go next? I know everybody here is focused on the future future of what the food business looks like, the future of food experience. I thought it would be good to fast forward just a little bit. Gut har harmony, you know. What's it going to look like when we have sensors in our body, when we can take a pill and that pill in our stomach tells us something? It's a little bit of futuristic kind of view. We talk about indoor farming and farming in you know, in close to places as opposed to shipping a trailer of lettuce from California to Canada in the middle of the winter. What, 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 what does skyline farming look like? And we often talk about the theater of food, you know, and the sensorial kind of foodscape. There's people looking into how to recreate those emotional moments, you know, that childhood moment when you smell a cinnamon roll in a bakery on the beach in Connecticut, you know. That's a science, that emotional science of an experience. And I love this one. Who's heard of drone foraging? Anybody? It's, it's an amazing idea, right? When we think about 
the demand for amazing mushrooms and truffles and things like that? What if drones could help us do that? So technologies change. It once was a can of soup, and maybe today it's Soylent, and who knows what it'll be in the future. Um, but nourishment, I think, is something, and the emotion and the theater and the connectivity of food experience, I think, is, uh, is always been here and is kind of, I think, very embedded in us. We haven't changed as fast as technologies change. And you see it. You see what the, what the mobile phone is doing to people because our bodies are not yet ready to manage it. And uh, I don't know if anyone's reading Alice Waters' new book. It's, it's amazing. She was a Montessori teacher at one point, and she just talks about the experience of watching children you know, walk into a room with fresh flowers and, and fresh vegetables and smelling and tasting and connecting over food. And I, I think sometimes we forget that as we're engineering the next, you know, billion dollar Annie's. So I'll leave you with that and I'll just give you one final example. Um, think about the experience of kind of receiving a warm bread right out of the oven. And think about kind of ripping that bread open and think about what you smell and what you feel and what you taste and that kind of smile and that biochemical reaction, whether you're doing it alone or with people, breaking bread, right? There's a reason for that. That is, at the end of the day, when you have a food product in your hand, when you're testing it with consumers, when you're you know, taking it to market, and I, I love the draft latte example because I think it echoes exactly this. But ask yourself, are we achieving some of that? Are some of those experiential things happening? And uh, I'll end on this note, because I, I think any family story should end with family. This is uh, my 14-year-old, Leaf, who uh, takes over our kitchen every month or so and turns our house into a restaurant. And you know, we spend so much time in the last decade talking about millennials. What do millennials need? We study millennials. We're designing for millennials. Millennials don't like this. Millennials don't like that. Okay, but let's think, I think, about the future, and let's think about, you know, a little bit beyond. We talk about sustainability, 100 years of sustainability. Let's think about 100 years of consumers. Let's, let's think forward. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. That was truly, truly interesting, and I could not agree more with you that it's all about great fresh bread. Love it. Our next speaker is Nell putman Farr, who has a really, really interesting uh, set of experiences. She is presently a postdoctoral researcher at the Yale School of Management, researching how, how framing and conceptual cues into impact design making and satisfaction. So at Yale, she works very closely with the faculty and partners of the Yale Center for Customer Insights, looking for ways to imply consumer decision-making uh, insights to help nudge people, to, uh, to help nudge people forward. Uh, let me say that again. To help nudge people toward better financial and physical well-being. But what is so interesting with her, she is a person with a PhD, but she has worked for eight years as well in the financial industry. So she has this really unique combination of, I would call, real-world, real business experience, and at the same time, applying that in a very academic way as well to think through how can we get consumers to make better choices. Now. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm an academic, which means that um, I have this combination of research and, and teaching sort of as, what I, as how I think about the world at this point. And so I am going to present to you today um, some research in the hope that these may be some interesting lessons for you in terms of how to think about framing food decisions and the ways that, we, that people make decisions in order to help them make potentially better decisions. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is actually work we've been doing in partnership with Google. Um, it's been a really interesting and, and fruitful partnership over several years now where we have these ideas, we have things that we think about in terms of ways that you might nudge people. Um, and Google really cares deeply about their employees and the well-being of their employees and tr trying to think about how to bring these two things together 
um, and the academic research and how it can really apply and, and help people make better decisions. Um, so these are all examples of mushroom tacos, and hopefully some of them make you cringe. Um, I am not going to talk to you today about how to make a better mushroom taco. If you want to do that, you should go talk to Scott. Um, they've been doing a lot of work about how to think about making a better mushroom taco. Um, but what I am going to talk to you about today is how to think about how you frame that decision. If we want to push people to make um, towards a plant-based diet, towards making these healthier decisions, how do we think about the context in which they're making those decisions? How do we think about the words that are used around those decisions? Um, these things actually really matter in terms of helping people um, think about the decision that they're making and these nudges that can help them to make better decisions. So at Yale, we talk about what we call the 4P model um, as a way of thinking about framing this, as a way of thinking about how we influence people to make better decisions. And at the core of this is this idea of person. It's, it's people's goals, it's people's intentions, it's people's habits. Um, these are all things that are very hard to change, but really meaningful if you can change them. Um, and so it's, it's these things that cause people to change how they think about decisions and how they make decisions in the long term. Um, and this is sort of the holy grail of this influence piece. Not really what I'm going to talk to you about today, but really interesting area um, and one that we're trying to do more work in now. A second piece is process. Um, and this is this idea of how choices are made. In academics, we also often call this um, choice architecture. Um, and it's really about the way that th choices are presented to people. So this can be how easy it is to see them, but it's order effects. Um, it's defaults, it's perhaps what portion size is the default, it's what order the food is presented to you in, things like this. Um, also not what I'm going to talk about for the focus of today. Um, third area is possibilities. Um, and so it, this is really about what choices are presented to people. So in children's lunch boxes, are you giving them apple slices instead of tortilla chips? Things like that. What size is the plate that you're offering to people? How are you presenting the food to them in the way that helps them make a better decision? And yet again, not what I'm going to talk about for the most of today. <laughs> this last piece is persuasion. And this, as you may have guessed by now, is the piece that I'm focusing on today. Um, so this is this idea of how choices are communicated. And this is about context. It's about language. It's about framing. Um, and these are things that, in theory, min in many ways, you think of as being really easy. Um, language is something that you can change. It's not that hard to do. You can just change the name of something. You can just put the sign in a different place. Um, a lot of these things are really easy to do, which also means they're really easy to get wrong or to not do well. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of this, how we think about the research in this area to think about doing this part well. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this, it, this question of moments of truth and thinking about, at least for the first part um, of what I'm going to say, how, how you think about what the right moment to reach people is. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you today about two um, projects that we've been doing with Google, one that we sort of did last year um, and we have some great results for you, and one that's actually ongoing now that I think is really interesting. Um, so we know that orders placed in advance um, can reduce the amount of calories that people consume. We know that people are better at making decisions at the beginning of the month. It's easier to start something when you feel like you have this fresh moment of, of beginning. Um, and all of these are really important things to think about when you're thinking about want, should conflicts. So I want a brownie at 3 p.m. when I have a cup of coffee. I really want that chocolate. I know I shouldn't really eat it, that I don't need it. It's not something that's going to be good for me. If you present the brownie to me when I have a cup of coffee in my hand and it's 3 o'clock and my blood sugar is low, it's going to be really hard for me to resist that. If you ask me to make the decision at 10 o'clock in the morning, when I've just had breakfast and thinking about what I just ate for breakfast, I'm not hungry, it's going to be a lot easier for me to say no. And so we think a lot about these, these questions of when you, when you ask people to make a decision. We know that reminders work. Um, this is an interesting issue. We know that, um, for example, with, with um, when you put a, but, sorry, we know that reminders work, but we also know that it matters when you remind people. And so if you think about this issue of getting people to take the stairs, for example, um, if you put a sign, if you have an escalator and stairs side by side, and you put a sign right at the base of the escalator and encouraging people to take the stairs, they're not very likely to do it. Because by the time they reach that point, they've already made their decision. They've already got to their decision point. If you back the sign up, even 20 feet, you can actually have a much greater impact on people's likelihood of making the choice to take the stairs. And so thinking about these moments when people make their decisions is really important. 
Another example that I like is about bringing your grocery bag. And maybe this is just me, but I have an ongoing problem with this issue. Um, I <laughs> the signs that I see at checkout reminding me to bring my grocery bag drive me slightly crazy. Because by the time I'm standing in the checkout line, there is no way that I'm going to get grocery bags. Um, the signs at the door are a little bit better. Um, it kind of depends if it's raining and how far my car is in the parking lot. Um, but it, it, it's a little bit better. At least you've gotten me a little bit earlier in the decision process. The ones in the parking lot are still better. But what I really need is a sign as I walk out my front door that tells me to grab my grocery bags and bring them with me. Um, and so this brings me to what we, what we decided to test with Google. And so they had this issue. This was a, an interesting problem for them of wanting to increase people's hydration, how much water people were drinking, um, but at the same time really having this tension of too many plastic bottles and not wanting to increase the number of plastic bottles that people were using. And so we know from having surveyed, from having asked people, that people have bottles and have reusable bottles. They have these reusable bottles. They want to use them. They recognize this is an issue. But the problem is they just forget. Um, the bottles are sitting there at their desk. By the time they get to the water station, they sort of say, oh, well, you know what, I'm already here. I'm not going to go back to my desk and, and get the bottle. Um, and I would do it if, if I thought of it, but it's just too inconvenient. And so what we thought about is whether we could actually change the moment of truth where we were catching them in this decision process. And so we decided to put po posters in two different locations. One of them is sort of the standard location that you'd think about. It's right next to the, the place where they get the water. Um, and it says, are you drinking enough today? We actually had several different content um, topics in the posters. But it was just this reminder when they were at the water to say, are you drinking enough today? Would, are you using a reusable bottle today? Things like that. The other piece that we did is we actually put the same set of posters in the desk area. So looking at saying, okay, we know people have these posters at their desks. Can we shift their behavior towards getting them to actually remember to grab the bottle from the desk? And what was interesting in this is it's also thinking about what's the trigger? So I'm sitting there at my desk. I know I have the bottle. Can I just remind people, can I make the association with grabbing the bottle when you're at your desk? So these were effective. Um, the posters near the water, you did see a moderate increase in water that was dispensed through the water dispenser in gallons of water. Um, you saw a much more significant effect in terms of the amount of water dispensed when you put the posters near the desks. And what's interesting in this is if you think about um, controlling for the number of cups that were used. I don't know if you noticed in the previous slide there were actually cups next to the water dispenser. If you control for the number of plastic cups used, this effect is actually even more significant. But there's a more interesting story, I think, here, which is that we continued to measure um, their behavior after the posters came down. And so what you see is the posters near the water after the posters came down, this green bar, no real effect. But the behavior continued after the posters were taken down when we had put the posters near their desks. And so I find this really interesting because I had talked about person at the beginning and this idea of changing habits. And so what we appear to have done here is really shifted people's habits to sort of give them an environmental trigger that caused them to bring the water bottle when they left their desks. And this is a really powerful shift in their behavior. Um, so I mentioned that we had a couple of different posters. Um, this was an example of the other one, that one of the other ones that we used. And what was interesting here is we didn't have a big impact um, from the content. Um, and we were surprised by this. We thought the content would actually have more impact. Um, now, maybe it's because our content was just so wonderful that all of them worked well. Um, that's possible. Um, but we also think it's interesting to think about, um, in this case, one is I think the location was just so much more powerful than the content that that effect dominated. Um, but it's also, I think, really interesting and, and an area that's worth more study to think about why content works better in some cases than in others. Um, and I'm going to come back to this mushroom taco to talk about this. So this is the example that we have here. Uh, this is the project that we're doing now. Um, and what we're thinking about here is to say, okay, you could call this a mushroom taco, and that would be fine, and that's descriptive. But does it matter? Can we think about different ways of naming this that would really change people's behavior? And we know that in particular for these plant-forward um, choices, menu items, the naming is really important, getting people's attention, getting their interest when there are so many other choices that they could be making. And so we decided to, to look at whether um, naming it in different ways actually shifts people's opinions, shifts people's behaviors. So this is also work with Google. It's also work with WRI and a bunch of other partners, some of whom may be here. 
Um, and what I will tell you just to start is that this is in sort of the still testing phase. Um, we've been testing this online in a lot of different ways and we're moving into actual choices that people make um, in dining decisions. So here are some examples of things that you could call a mushroom taco. Um, there's a lot of different things here and you could think of some of these being better than others. And I think one of the things that it's important to talk about in the research context is to think about we also care about what, don't, what doesn't work. Um, it's not just about which name does well, but we also want to understand which names don't do well and how those might interact with the context um, in terms of really allowing us to learn things about how people make decisions. And as it turns out, the name does matter. My colors got mixed up, I'm sorry. So mushroom taco is the original name. Vegetarian mushroom taco doesn't do better. It actually doesn't do worse, um, which is interesting. Feel Fresh Taco does well. Korean Spice Shiitake Taco does very well. And this actually relates to an interesting con um, conversation that I had with chefs last week at Google where I was asking them which name they would choose. Um, and the response that I got from them was actually that the Korean Spice Shiitake Taco was probably the name that they would choose as well. But it was this question of why. And they weren't really sure. They were like, well, references to culture do well. Spice sounds good. But it was an interesting conversation to say, OK, can we, can we try and parse apart what are the reasons why one of these names would do better than the other? And think about that. And that's sort of where we, as academics, can add value to this conversation. So we actually ask people to rate um, names on 28 different dimensions. And we consolidated these down into five factors. And then tried to predict people's choices based on these five factors. Um, and this leads to some interesting results. And I will also highlight that these lead to some interesting results in terms of thinking differently about plant-based items than you think about meat-based items. Because we didn't get the same results for both groups. Um, and so what I'm showing you here are the results for plant-based items. And I'll talk a little bit about that difference. Um, so let me go through these quickly. Um, so this first category that we talked about was time and place. Thinking about associating with an occasion, associating with a season, um, something like Feel Fresh would go here. It has that summery, light feel. Um, and so trying to understand you know, what those associations with time and place really do to people. The second one is bold and unexpected. Um, and this is the Korean spice shiitake taco actually works well for this. Taco and Korean maybe don't automatically go together in people's minds. Um, it has bold flavors because of that spiciness. Um, it sounds like it might be colorful, things like that. Um, this works well, but this works well for plant-based items. It didn't actually work particularly well for the meat-based items. It was neutral for the meat-based items. And so it's an interesting thing to think about here. If you're trying to get people's attention for plant-based items, you're trying to sort of get them to try something. This bold and unexpected is actually something that's important to think about here. Not surprisingly, health and sustainability was sort of neutral in its effects. Um, you know, it was potentially negative for some of the meat-based items. When you look specifically at people who are trying to um, eat a primarily vegetarian diet or, or who are concerned about um, being on a diet, um, it does better. But overall, in the overall population, it doesn't do particularly well. This last one, and I think is really interesting, is the appealing and indulgent. Because we think about this a lot in terms of naming, making it sound really interesting, sorry, really indulgent, really luxurious. And this works well, but it did not work well for plant-based items. It worked really well for the meat-based items, but it didn't work well for the plant-based items. And I think that's an important distinction to think about. And I also think it's an important distinction to think about when you're thinking about people's ultimate satisfaction with their decision. Um, and so if you try to market a plant-based item in this really luxurious and indulgent way, but it's actually a f more fresh tasting thing, people are probably going to be disappointed with that decision even if the fresh taste and things like that are something that they would have really liked. And so it's important to think about matching the item to the language that you're using in the context. So that brings me to the end of this, which is to say um, really thinking about matching is what matters, both matching in terms of the moment of receptivity, catching people at the moment when you're going to be able to influence their decision, but also understanding what their goals and beliefs are about the thing that you're trying to get them to choose and matching the language that you use to their beliefs and expectations. That's it. Thank you very much, Nell. Scott? 
So I think we have now approximately 12 minutes, counting down, <laughs> for <laughs> questions. And I think there's a combination of questions from all of you. So if you actually use your app and post the questions, Hilda will be the moderator over here. And I'll have questions for you as well. So maybe as a starting point for you, Scott, apparently we have this new generation coming along, Gen Z and Millennials. But I think we tend to forget about whether it's the baby boomers, the Gen X, the Gen Ys, they're still there as well. Do you see actually in your world that a similar amount of change is coming to those generations as we see with Gen Z and the Millennials? Yeah, change is a funny thing because it's, uh, we love talking about it and we love pointing to how quickly it's happening and how significant it is. Um, you know, I, 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 we like looking at all generations. Um, if I look at, um, we did some work recently on the smart kitchen. You know, the future, of we, we talk a lot about the smart home, the smart kitchen, and we talk about all these amazing gadgets and, and everything, I mean, many of which um, Google and others are working on. But what is the future of the smart kitchen in the context of aging? Um, what does that change? What does aging look like as we live longer? Um, what could that kind of assisted kitchen look like? Um, similarly, you know, um, if you kind of span it uh, to kind of global factors, what's happening around the world? We have such a North American context, but I don't know, change uh, across generations is very different in, in different markets. If we look at, you know, look at, at what's happening in, in the Saudi market in, in terms of everything opening up there and youth and you know I think half the country is under the age of 30. Um, so I think change, the context of change across generations, across geographies is always an important context. Um, and it's actually, I, I think, extremely complex to understand the pace of change, the velocity, um, and uh, how quickly is something going to happen. We talk about even just a simple example, e-commerce and food, right? Today we're moving towards 20% e-commerce sales. In other categories, food is lagging far behind. How quickly are we going to catch up, you know? Is that, you know where, how quickly can Amazon push us to, to the point where, you know, we're buying 25% of our food online? Will that ever happen, you know? Um, and where will it happen in what categories and so on and so forth? So change is just a fascinating thing because there's so many variables and the time context is, is hard to predict. Thank you. Maybe for now, um, you've done amazing work with Yale uh, to get more insights into what makes a consumer tick and how might you influence behavior. One of the questions that we always discuss internally is how transparent should you be with the intent as the provider? And the more you learn, the more you know, and the more you can apply. So what are your thoughts on how to actually, how transparent to be about the intentions that you have with regards to what you're trying to achieve? Um, so there's some really interesting research that's actually coming out now. Um, and I recently saw Cass Sunstein presented, and he's somebody who's worked with Richard Thaler a bunch um, around this nudges and choice architecture. Um, and what he was talking about was really this idea of, you know, do people care if they know that they're being nudged? How much does this matter that people know that they're being nudged? Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important question. And I think um, one of his main conclusions is, that it's okay if they know that they're being nudged if they know the reason that they're being nudged. What people mm -hmm. really don't like is to feel like they're being nudged for some reason that they can't understand and that they might not agree with. But if, they, if there's some degree of transparency about why the nudge is taking place um, and openness about it, then they're actually in many ways more likely to go along with it. They don't resist it if they know why it's happening. What ha what the concern that you have and the problem that you have is when people realize that a nudge is happening but they don't know why it's happening, and then they start to question the motives. Um, and so I think this is this interesting issue of getting people to buy into the decision, and it's something we've been thinking about more and more to say, okay, it's great to get people to respond to nudges, but actually what is potentially even more powerful is if you can get them to agree with the underlying principle in terms of why you're nudging them. Um, and so giving them, whether it's making, they're making choices that go along with those nudges, so you, you first have them make the choice, and then give them the nudge that makes it easier for them to adhere to that yeah. choice. But is it predominantly when you have issues of where we think we know better for the audience? Because if you think about it, retail or commerce uh -huh. is applying nudges every day, and we don't talk about it. Right, and I think that's where, you know, you talk about, like, people now think about end caps more, for example, and what's on the end cap. Um, and now they're suspicious of why, well, this is somebody trying to promote something where they'll make more money or, 
you know, they want to launch a new product, but that's not necessarily in line with my best interests. But if you can say to them, you know, here's a topic area, you know, that we think you care about. If you care about this area, here's some, some things that might be useful for you. Um, then they're, they, they, I think they're much more responsive to it. They can say, okay, I understand why this is here, and this is easy for me, and, I, and I'll respond to it. But it's when people are suspicious about the transparent, uh, suspicious about the motive, that I think they become um, more resistant to nudges when they realize they're happening. So it's this two-stage process. It's do I realize that there's a nudge in place, and then what's my response to that? Do I resist it, or do I actually say, okay, this is making my life easier, I'll go along with it? And I think it's when they respect the motives behind the nudge that they're more likely to take that second path. Now, the awareness is a first yeah. path, mm -hmm. a first issue, but yeah. All righty. Next question maybe for the two of you. So if we're talking about actually the next generation of food experiences, out of which corner do you think the most amazing new food experience designers will come? Hard question. <laughs> I, I'll actually come back to sort of how I answered the previous question, which is to say um, I think people want to feel like individuals. Um, we see this over and over again in that people don't want to feel like they're one of a crowd. They want to feel different from everyone else. Um, and so this whole idea of personalized nutrition and personalized choices um, I think is really powerful and allowing people to feel like they're customizing the decisions that they're making. Um, I think can be really powerful, even if those customizations aren't really that different. It's more about this feeling of that I'm different from everybody else. And this goes along to the issue of nudges, of if you're trying to nudge something where you're making people feel like they're one of the crowd, that they're a number, um, they're more likely to resist that. But if they can feel like they're making a conscious choice, that they are unusual, different, unique, um, I think they're more likely to go along with it and more likely to be interested in what you're offering if they have that feeling of personalization. It's an interesting tension between kind of personalization yeah. and customization versus curation. Mm -hmm. um, because you talk to some consumers and you hear a lot about, I can't, I have too many decisions in my life, please curate it for me. Just, you know, I don't even want to choose from a menu, like just give me the tasting menu versus, you know, all the talk about customization and mass personalization and all that. Um, I, I think it's interesting to think about multidisciplinary design in these experiences. When you put an architect in a room, an industrial designer, a food scientist, people that come from many walks of life and ask them to think about the experience of design and, and food, and I think it, it becomes a really interesting discussion. And I, I think for me, it's, it's both the tension and the collaboration that comes from having so many different thinkers and lenses and hats uh, at the table in designing food experience. I think what's interesting as well to add to that is the scalability. Because you have on the one hand customization, personalization, and then you get a global brand image, and how do you ultimately bring those together going forward? We've actually I mean, talked about it in some ways with your curated salads, which is, is this idea that you know, here's a menu card, here's, some thing, here's, here's a salad that you can make yourself, and we've put these ingredients here, but you can make it your own by choosing to leave things out or you know, adding in something else. And so it's this idea that even though these ingredients are here and everybody's getting the same salad recipe, the idea that I can customize it in some way because I'm different can actually be really powerful in terms of getting people to think about you know, what they're choosing and, they're like, uh, and, and how much they're going to like that item. Yeah. Then Scott, in your work with the variety of actually the brands you've worked with as well, do you see actually a change in the way how they look at a food product versus a food experience and what ultimately they are bringing to the market combined? I, I think it starts with a lot of aspiration. There is a lot of aspiration to create experience, and I think the orthodoxies and the systems kind of slowly squeeze it out. And so I think the intention and the aspiration is, is there. Um, but I, it's, experience is often thought of as having interactive components, and you know, it's easy in the digital world when it comes to banking to create a lot of interaction in the food space outside of, you know, we look at the Shake Shacks of the world that are creating new experiences. In the CPG world or in the packaged food experience, you know, it's much harder. 
And at the perimeter of the store, you start to see it. You know, we, we were talking recently about the deli. And what is the future of the deli experience versus lining up with a ticket in, in the very old school way, right? Where's the smoke? Where's the, where's the kind of stimuli? How come I can't interact? It's just a glass window, and I wait in line, and I stare at a bunch of kind of plastic-wrapped turkeys. That is ripe for experience. And I think these, there are some areas where we really have to push the boundary where we can. But it, when it's in a box, it's very hard. Fair enough. Let's look at maybe a first audience question. <laughs> have you come across specific food items that appeal equally well to both baby boomers and millennials and Gen Z? Yeah, I mean, barbecue. We look at, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, that, that, and, but there's reason, right? You talk about the, the rebirth of, of high-end artisanal sourdough bread and barbecue and these things. There's a reason, and it's, I think, because we are wired. We are wired to kind of, like, put people in a lab and, and, and kind of waft in the, the smell of smoked meat. And I suspect you'll have the same reaction from, you know, an 80-year-old or a 15-year-old. And so the, these are the types of products that we see um, cross the spectrum. Then maybe going back to the first question, <laughs> now, the Beach Town Taco. Why was it such an epic fail? So... We're still working on this one, but I have a very strong suspicion, which is that one of the questions that we asked people, one of the rating dimensions that we gave people was um, to ask them whether or not they understood what this item was. You know, whether the name actually tells me what this item is. Um, and Beach Town Taco does not do particularly well on that dimension. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's an important thing to think about when you're trying to think about making a name bold and exciting is people still want to actually know what it is. Um, and if they're completely confused by the name of the item, then that can actually be a deterrent for them in thinking about choosing it. All righty. In the last minute we have, any closing advice for the audience? Things that you say, when you leave tomorrow afternoon, here's one nugget that I want to share with you or leave you with. I'll, I'll, I'll throw out one activity that we often do with people. Live the experience. Play act something or somebody or some place you want to be. If you want to understand my son, the 14-year-old, become the 14-year-old. Don't go study them. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about anthropology and immersion and ethnography. That's great to a point. You know, read up on the persona and, of the 14-year-old and become the 14-year-old for a day. Live the world through the lens of a 14-year-old, and you're going to see things that you've never seen before. And the same goes for an 80-year-old ha that has mobility issues. You know, be that 80-year-old. Live it, even for an hour. See what happens. I guess I would probably give you something very similar, which is to be very conscious of the context, generally speaking, in which people are making the decisions. So it's a very different thing. Um, people will make a very different set of decisions when they're walking in and looking at a whole bunch of items in a lunch, um, in a cafeteria setting where they're looking at the food items. Um, those are not the same decisions that they're making when they're looking at a menu two hours before lunch trying to think about what they want to eat. And so trying to be very conscious and aware of how the context in which people are making decisions influences their likelihood of choosing things. With that, I thank you very much for your contributions today. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, for our next speaker, we're going to welcome Matt Roth to the stage. Matt's the co-founder of the Feed Collaborative at a little place called Stanford, where he practices design thinking and sustainable food system innovation. Prior to that, Matt led the um, Sustainable Food Innovation Program at Stanford. He's an operations executive in a previous life at Attune Foods in Neiman Ranch. And Matt's foray into food really started in his childhood when he grew up on a 10,000 acre conventional corn farm. So ask him about that at lunch. Thank you. All right, am I on? Hello? Yep, there we are. Okay. Um, so my goal for today is to bring the classroom here. I teach at, design, uh, at Stanford University, I teach design thinking. And what that means is that today is going to be, at least in the next 30 minutes, is going to be very interactive. Um, and uh, so we need to take care of a couple of housekeeping. So one thing is that I'm going to have you be doing three exercises in pairs today. And it's going to be loud and raucous, and I'm going to be, I'm going to need a way to get your attention. So when you hear this, 
That means to stop what you're doing and to look forward. Now, in the event that that fails, there's a trick that we have in, in, as teachers um, where we ask you to, um, to clap once if you can hear me. So we're going to practice this right now, okay? And if you hear me, if, if this fails, I'm going I'm to be asking you, clap once if you can hear me. So let's do this. Clap once if you can hear me. A little louder. Clap once if you can hear me. All right, very good. Okay, um, so to put myself into context, oh, and I'm sorry, um, my co-conspirator at the Feed Collaborative, uh, Deborah Dunn, was unable to make it today. She developed a really unnerving eye condition. Um, and so I'm solo in that respect, but I am going to ask Hildreth, to join me today to demonstrate some of these exercises. Uh, but before we jump into these exercises, oh, sorry, one other piece of housekeeping. You're gonna be doing work today with a partner. So in the next 60 seconds, I need you to identify and introduce yourselves to your partner. We can do this in threes, partners are best. All right, it's working. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I'm just going to put myself into context a little bit. So at the Feed Collaborative, our mission is to equip and inspire the next generation of food system leaders and to amplify and accelerate the work of organizations and people who we think of as doing really interesting work that, with the potential of systemic impact. Uh, to give you an example of the kind of projects we work on, in our graduate level course last year, we did a collaborative project with Patagonia Provisions. Uh, around their long root ale, uh, the goal of which was to really understand um, and think about how we might shape craft beer enthusiasts' uh, um, behavior with respect to their long root ale. Now, I should say that we have a pretty strong point of view about working on problems um, that benefit people and the planet. And the way that we manifest that in our work is that we are a collaboration between the School of Earth Sciences at Stanford and the Design School, which is also known as the D School. And the intersection, so this is very intentional on our part in that um, we look to the School of Earth Sciences to really understand kind of the science and the, and the real problems behind the, our major systems, food, water, energy, and the climate. Um, and then we take that information and, and we put that into the context of how people think about these problems and we design uh, essentially behavioral uh, interventions um, to help them uh, develop decision-making heuristics that result in the kind of outcomes with respect to people on the planet that we're looking for. Now, the toolbox that we use is this collective set of abilities known as uh, design thinking. And I've been doing this for nearly a decade now, teaching and practicing this stuff. And much to my mother's chagrin, I have been unable to come up with a way to really explain what it is. Uh, the best way to understand design thinking is to do it. And so we're going to now start with a few exercises. I'm going to have Hill just come out here uh, with me. Now, what I'd like for you to do is to uh, stand up and get together with your partner. All right. Okay. So this... This first exercise is going to be very simple. And the way it's going to work is that we are just going to count to three, back and forth, count to three. And it's going to look like this. One. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. One. Okay. You got the point? <laughs> now, everybody count to three just as we've done. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap once if you can hear me. All right, very good. Okay, so the next part of this is that instead of one, we're going to clap two, three. Clap two, three. Okay, so I'll demonstrate this. Ready? Clap. Two. Three. Two. Three. Two. Three. Okay, <laughs> now, now um, we're going to introduce, because you're an expert at this, um, when we mess up, 
we're going to raise our hands and say, ta-da! Okay, so let's practice. We just messed up. Ta-da! Okay. Um, we'll demonstrate this. So, two. Three. Two. Three. Two. Three. Ta-da! Okay, now it's your turn. Go. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Okay. You're, you're welcome to sit down, but you are still, there are two more exercises in which you're going to need to work with your partner. So please grab a seat. Is it, is, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so when you messed up, when you messed up, how did your partner react? Were they like, that idiot? <laughs> no. They laughed, right? They laughed. And I want to make the point here that um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this expression of embracing failure, um, celebrating failure. And I think that that is directionally correct. But at the D school, we have a, a little different frame on it. And the framing is uh, this idea of having an experimenter's mindset an experimenter's mindset. Now, to some of you, uh, you may know this uh, as being described as like rapid iteration, rapid prototype iteration. Um, but in our language, we really think about it as having an experimenter's mindset. And the value of having an experimenter's mindset uh, really is to design experiments at a scope, a scale, and a resolution that if they fail, you can actually laugh about it. Okay. Too often, and we see this all the time in Silicon Valley, we invest lots of money into new products, ideas, and services only to see them fail in the marketplace. And I was a part of a, a, a food, a packaged food uh, startup about a decade ago, um, similar story. We raised a bunch of money, venture capital money, um, commercialized a product, we got it distributed in vir virtually every grocery store in America only to realize that there was no need in the marketplace for it. And so we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this Whereas what I know now, had we practiced that then, we probably, for less than $100, could have realized that this thing was not going to work. So design experiments at a scope, scale, and resolution that if they fail, you can embrace the learning and you can laugh about it. OK. So now we're going to do another exercise. And uh, again, you're going to do this one with your partner. And so my wife's birthday is coming up. And we are going to plan her birthday party. Okay, you're going to help me plan her birthday party. And the way that this exercise is going to work is um, one of us, I'll start with an idea, and then you're going to say yes, but, and suggest another idea. And I, I'm going to say yes, but, and we'll keep, keep going like that. So, Got it. Um, I, so my, my wife uh, loves horses. Maybe we can get some ponies for her. Yes, but ponies are really small. Okay. And so, what, what, so maybe what else would we do? Uh, what about regular size horses? They're cool. Yeah. They're tall. But regular sized horses aren't going to fit in our condominium, so <laughs> maybe we could just get a birthday cake instead. Yeah, but birthday cakes, like no bacon. And millennials don't like them, so because uh, they're not healthy. Okay, so what else? So what about, uh, what about bacon dipped cupcakes? Yeah, but that just doesn't sound very good. Uh, okay, so you get the point. So with your partner, try to. Try to uh, design my wife's birthday party, each partner yes budding the idea. Okay, I'm going to give you about two minutes to do this. Go. Clap once if you can hear me. Good. All right. 
Who planned a party? Nobody did. <laughs> okay, so now we are going to demonstrate uh, what's known at the D school as the yes and mentality. And so we're going to plan my wife's birthday party, yes anding every idea. Mm -hmm. So I still think that we should get ponies. Yeah, and then we should put little bacon dip cupcakes on the saddles. <laughs> yes, and we should take them down to the park and we should hire a circus to come. Yeah, and if the circus is there, we should make sure that they're all under the age of 34. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and. Okay, you get the point. So now, with your partner again, design my wife's birthday party, yes, anding every idea that comes up in the conversation. Okay, go. Well, I have clowns. What's that? more fun. Yeah. I'm realizing, I think I'm going to end quite early, but that's all right. Actually, I, I'm, I'm done with you. All right. All right. Okay, show of hands. Who planned a birthday party for my wife? Everybody did. Does anyone want to share one? No? Yeah, you want to share? Sure. We'll yeah. Share. yeah. I said, okay, we have to have a lot of fresh things to drink. And then you said, I would have to be a boat with a juggler on the boat. And I said, we're going to have a juggler. We're going to have lots of music. And we could have a uh, Maker International taco bar. And I said, as long as we have spicy salsa. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. She would love that, I think. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share their, the birthday party they designed for my wife? No? Anyone? Yeah. Ah. Oh my God, that sounds, that sounds delicious. Thank you for that. I think I'm going to steal that. All right. All right. Okay. So I think, I think you get the point here. Um, I do a lot of work, certainly uh, teaching undergraduates and graduate students at Stanford, but I also do a lot of engagement with executives in various aspects of the food system. And th I think the most common thing, the most common challenge I see in organizations is that when they're trying to generate ideas. When they're trying to think about maybe new products and services or customer experiences, um, they try to do both yes and and yes but at the same time. And it's impossible to do both of them well. And the yes but, what comes up there is um, this lens of is that idea technologically feasible? Is that idea financially viable? And so yes but just creates this screen that disallows any new ideas or thinking to move forward. Make sense? So yes and is really about establishing a culture, being mindful of when we are in this place of generating ideas, to know that we're there and to create an environment in which all ideas can emerge. Now, some of you have probably heard the expression that uh, no ideas are bad ideas. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Most ideas are bad ideas. Most ideas will never make their way to the marketplace, right? The point is that we need to create culture in our organizations in which all ideas can emerge. That's the most important thing. Because if we can uh, do that and create space for those ideas, these new crazy ideas to move forward, that's how we begin to get at truly innovative new thinking and ways of solving customer problems or clients' problems or, or uh, service recipients' problems. Now, you think about the mechanics of that, like why does that work? It's surely uh, a matter of law of numbers, okay? The idea being that if you can create this culture of yes and, the potential solution set, right? 
just the sheer number of potential new ideas that could potentially solve a need in the marketplace is larger. And that's the goal of yes and culture. Make sense? Okay. So we've got one more here. I think I'm going to end a little early. Not bad. Okay. Um, so with your partner, in the next five minutes, uh, I want you to have a conversation about um, sharing with your partner what is the need that you and your, or your organization are trying to solve for your customer or client or service recipient, okay? Have a five-minute conversation with your partner discussing and sharing what is the need that you are solving or that your organization is solving for your customer, your client, or your service recipient. Clear? Okay, five minutes, go.
All right. All right. Okay. So I want to talk uh, a little bit about needs, and this is going to be the last uh, conversation, and I think we're going to move on to breakout sessions. Um, so I want to pose the question, what does she need? She needs a ladder. A, a book? She needs what? She needs information. She needs information. Yep. She needs what? She needs a computer. I've heard some people say, uh, I don't know what she needs, but I need that bottle of Jameson right there. Um, okay, so let's start with a book. Well, why might she need a book? Uh, what? She needs to research. Then she might want to research as a way to learn something, right? And why might she need to learn something? Why, why, why might she need a way to learn something? What's that? She's trying to solve a problem. And why does she need to be able to solve a problem? She's curious, right? Why do we need to satisfy her curiosity? Because she's human, right? She needs a way to be human. Yeah, she needs a way to problem solve. Okay. So you see what we've done. We've gone from she needs a book to she needs a way to learn to she needs a way to be able to develop her full capacity as a human, as a way to contribute to society, as a way to contribute to the advancement of humanity. This is called a, a needs ladder or a why ladder. And this is really fundamental to the work that we do in design thinking. Now, most of you, um, and I'm, as I refer to you uh, making books, I'm referring to whatever it is, the products and services that you're making for your customers or clients. Most of you are focused on making books. And this is understandable because you are expert in making books. That's, you've probably had a lot of training, you have a degree, you have experience, all in making really, really fine books. Plus, the demands of the capital invested in your organization are requiring you to make really fine books. This makes sense. But the problem that we see in organizations by focusing on books as the solution is that we only ever get incremental innovation. Right? We're only ever designing a little bit better book, step change. Whereas in design thinking, which is really about understanding what do people really need? What motivates people? What do they care about, right? We begin scratching and digging a little bit deeper. And we get to this place, well, maybe what she needs is a way to learn. OK? This is like really key to design thinking. Now, what's the value of that? I think there are two parts. One is that, again, if we're trying to innovate new ideas and solutions to problems in the marketplace, if we're thinking about um, defining the problem as she needs a book, well, how many solutions are there to that? There's a book, or maybe a little bit better book. But if we open up the question, the problem that we're trying to solve for to she needs a way to learn, how many potential solutions are there to that? Many, right? So what we're doing, again, is we're taking the potential solution set from a very small number of potential solutions to a very large number of potential solutions. And again, just by sheer numbers, we're more likely to identify in that process a new solution that is really going to change her life. Now, the other thing that we do when we begin to identify these deeper needs of people is that we identify things that are socially and emotionally resonant to them, right? And if we're able to design solutions that are really meeting those social and emotional needs of people, they're far more likely to desire the thing that we're designing for them. This is really powerful stuff. And if you look around in the marketplace, you'll see examples of these things. I think the things that we all carry around in our pockets and our purses are an example. But when you combine the numbers of ideas that are also overlapping with solving a potential social or emotional need of a person, this is where innovation happens. This is where game-changing stuff occurs. And this is the best way that I have to explain the real value and the heart of design thinking. It's being human-centered and understanding the real needs that people have. So I think the thing that I'll, I'll leave you with, uh, and the thing that I think you will, that I hope you will think about from here until the time that you get back to your organizations, is thinking about what are the books that we're designing, the sort of proverbial books. But what might those books how might we expand the need of those books to a larger solution set? What might your customers, clients, 
or service recipients really need? And to begin to think about potential solutions to, the, to that question. Thank you so much for engaging. Uh, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get 200 people to <laughs> do what you've done today. Uh, this in itself was uh, an experiment, uh, I think a mostly successful one. I'm going to be running a couple break breakout sessions. I hope to see you in one of those. If not, uh, we are always at the Feed Collaborative looking for interesting organizations to collaborate with. Uh, the slides will be put up. My contact information is in there, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Um, before everybody gets up to go to our break, just a couple notes about your breakout sessions. Um, first, a huge thank you to our morning's presenters, another really strong group of presentations. Um, I love seeing everybody on the sides. It reminds me of those two old men from the Muppets. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so back to breakouts. So if you look at the back of your badges, if you've pre-selected a session, that will tell you the session. If you haven't pre-selected, don't fear. You can get in a standby line outside of the session door. So we have four sessions. So they're all starting at 10.30. So you'll have a nice long break and then be at your breakouts at 10.30. So for A1, know your consumer. That's going to be in this theater. So come back here at 10.30. It's going to be set up time until 10.30. A2 Flavor Design is in the Napa Valley Vintage Theory, Theater, so that's downstairs on this floor. And if you walk past where breakfast was this morning, you'll see a far door. A3 Crash Course in Design Thinking is in the Founders Boardroom, so that's on the second floor up the center stairs. And it will be to the left. And then from Idea to Shelf is the Food Business School Classroom, second floor, up that same central staircase to the right. Just look for CIA staff wearing these gold badges and they'll be friendly and they'll help you find where you're going if you get lost, okay? Thank you.
This is Uncut with Matt Abdu at Pig Bleaker in the West Village of New York City. Having two restaurants is really kind of special for me because I get to really focus on all of my loves of cooking. Pig Beach is our Brooklyn barbecue spot, which focuses mostly on traditional barbecue, but with our New York City twist to it. And Pig Bleaker is our refined, smoke-centric comfort food restaurant, where we're taking all that theme from barbecue, but refining it to make it something more unique. So I am half Italian, half Lebanese, and I grew up my entire life with the Lebanese side telling me to sakdain and the Italian side telling me to manja, both of which just mean eat, live, love, be happy. There is no greater representation of love in my family than through food. It just really made me who I am today. Today we're making a smoked pastrami pork leg with a sweet and spicy barbecue mustard sauce. This dish plays very well on our menu here because all the processes of brining, rubbing, and smoking just create such depth of flavor that it really jumps off the palate the second you eat it. And when people see brined, smoked, rubbed pastrami ham, it's one of those things that just jumps out in their mind of, oh wow, I want to try this. So we take the outside muscle of a fresh leg of pork and we first begin by brining it in a traditional pastrami brine. In our pastrami brine we have water, salt, brown sugar, cure number one, black pepper, pickling spice, and smashed garlic. After it's brined, we pat it dry, season it pretty liberally with a house-made pastrami rub. The rub is what's really giving us all that delicious pastrami flavor and pizzazz. That, combined with the smoke, is what really separates this from being a traditional hand and making it something really unique. Our pastrami rub has kosher salt, ground coriander, butcher grind black pepper, sweet paprika, granulated garlic, granulated onion, Coleman's mustard powder, and light brown sugar. Season that pretty liberally, and then we place it in our smoker. Remove it from the smoker around 135 degrees. Let it rest for an hour and a half to carry up to about 145 degrees before serving. The mustard has yellow mustard, white granulated sugar, light brown sugar, apple cider vinegar, ketchup, kosher salt, Worcestershire sauce, granulated onion, granulated garlic, Frank's Red Hot, and ground black pepper. The outside muscle of this fresh pork leg is just smothered in love, from the brining process, to the rubbing process, to the smoking process, and then the applications are really endless in what you can use it for. It can be sliced paper thin and put in a Cuban sandwich, or it can be sliced and let on its own to be representative of a ham board with our country hams. It has all that love just wrapped up into one beautiful protein. So our Cuban sandwich has mustard sauce, house cured pickles, our pastrami smoked pork leg, a roasted pork loin, and melted Swiss cheese. You're getting not only that succulent, smoke, roasted ham and pork loin, but you're also getting that crisp texture of acidity of the pickles and that mustard with the unctuous cheese. It just really plays super well when you grill that bread and it's got that crunch. It just makes you want to keep biting back for more. Me personally, I would love to eat some sliced ham steak or a Cuban sandwich with a rosé or even Pinot Noir if you wanted to go that heavy food has that unique ability to make you just feel warm and good or put a smile on your face. And I love that all my life. Is it going to play a little music? 